two is now session. The Office of Jeff Perry presiding. State versus Kelsey Turner, C340752-1. Are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Was there anything we needed to address before we get started? Your Honor, if we could address the two objections that I filed. Okay. Um, which one did you want to start with? The court's pleasure. All right. There's an objection to victim speaker, uh, Ms. Earp, correct? That's correct. Did the state want to address that? Your Honor, um, I'm sure the court can recall um, with regard to the co-defendant's case, the court issued a minute order on July 22nd of 2022 um, indicating uh, that you would allow Ms. Earp to speak in Mr. Kennison's um, sentencing. I assume the same legal standard would apply for Ms. Turner. So I assume based on the court's order that it would be the same order. Did you want to be heard any further or did you want to submit on the written motion? No, Your Honor, I would submit on the written. All right, so I'm going to make the same finding that I did in regard to Mr. Kennison's case, that Ms. Earp will be allowed to speak. Um, the state had, had indicated to me that she had been with the deceased for decades. They celebrated holidays together. Um, their families were close. Um, given all of this, I do find that she meets the definition of someone directly and proximately harmed by the commission of this criminal offense, and I will allow her to speak. Um, I will note for the record this is a pretty full as a fully negotiated case. Um, That's correct. Your second objection was regarding the victim letters. That's correct. Do you want to be heard regarding that? I, I think it's the same reasoning, Your Honor, but also I would note, as the court I think just alluded to, this is a stipulated sentence of a 10 to 25, and uh, the state would ask that those letters be part of the record because that type of information is relevant in any sentence. And Your Honor, I'd submit on the written pleadings asking you that if you do it, or if you are inclined to allow them um, to be part of the record, they'd be left side filed. Okay, we will, do, we will left side file them. Ultimately, the same standard doesn't apply for victim letters as it does for um, victim speakers. And uh, we regularly have letters from people who um, have more tangential relationships to the deceased mm -hmm. because obviously the wedge of you know, the impact that somebody can have on a community is larger than just for people narrowly defined by statute. And so I will allow those letters and those will be left side filed. With that being said, we'll, uh, are we ready to proceed? Okay. Your Honor, the defense is ready. Okay. My notes reflect that the state is agreed to a 10 to 25 year uh, Nevada Department of Corruption sentence under the murder second degree statute. Is that still the state's position? Yes, Your Honor. Anything to add? Uh, no, if I could just be heard briefly. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I know the court is very familiar with the facts of this case, and I don't think that in a homicide investigation um, there will be adequate, uh, an adequate understanding of like the complicated dynamics that brought Ms. Turner and the victim in this case together. And there's certainly room for a lot of salacious speculation as to what the nature of their relationship was. I think the facts of this case demonstrate, though, that with regard to Ms. Turner, this was a transactional um, relationship to whatever extent. And um, she is, uh, has claimed that she um, has been the victim of domestic violence from two prior boyfriends. But what is clear is that she wasn't a victim of Mr. Burchard, the victim in this case. In fact, this was a relationship that was incredibly important to her so much so that she tried to marginalize or wedge herself um, in between the relationship of the victim and his longtime partner, Ms. Judy Earp, and tried to minimize the amount of influence Ms. Earp would have on the victim and increase her own um, influence on the uh, victim. And also within the facts of this case, um, there were threats made to roommates when it appeared that Ms. Turner's relationship with the victim um, might be cast aside or marginalized. As far as any trauma she might have experienced as a result of this relationship or this, these interactions, um, she certainly managed to cope with the fact of this case by having a, a GoFundMe page that she consented to um, to raise money for her defense, and she also unsuccessfully was in negotiations to appear in a television show called Love After Lockup. 
And her Instagram um, account is full of references to um, comments such as, if we're not talking about money, I'm not available. So she is someone who benefited greatly from the um, financial assistance of the victim. Um, the other thing I would just point out to the court is that she is not a bystander in the murder. Um, she is the one who initially set off the beating by alleging that there were highly inappropriate uh, images on the victim's phones. And this was actually a claim that she had uh, made in the past um, as in the past, we uh, had a look at this phone and that uh, claim turned out not to be true. Um, but it's an often repeated claim that Ms. Turner has made. Um, and she is the one in the course of these events who demanded the PIN identification code for the um, victim's bank, bank accounts. And she's the one that directed others to clean up the mess of the murder. And of course, most notably, she is the one that directed Mr. Kennison to uh, knock out the victim in this case and subject him to an incredibly long and painful beating. Um, you know, for her part, she was content to leave someone that she knew for a number of years who supported her and her child financially for a number of years to rot in the back of a car in the desert that he paid for. And then she was um, the person who tried to find a way to monetize this after. Um, you know, from the state's perspective, she's getting um, the negotiation or beneficial negotiation for her lack of violent criminal history. Um, but she was every bit involved in this homicide, and that is reflected in the negotiations. Thank you, Ms. Wackerly. Turning to uh, Ms. Sislak, did you want to be heard first? Did you, or did Ms. Turner want to speak first? Or um, like I'll go ahead and let Ms. Turner speak, and then um, I'll follow up. Do you have anything to say, Kelsey? No, Your Honor, I don't. Okay. This um, is your opportunity to address me if you want it, but it sounds like you don't want to speak at this no, time. Is that correct? Yes, okay, ma'am. Thank you. That's fine. Um, Ms. Sislak, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, Obviously, this is the resolution that we came to. We believed, both Ms. Turner and I, that this, this was the best resolution we were going to come to. Um, this was Ms. Turner's decision. And that being said, while I do not agree with the state's recitation of facts, I'll, I'll submit to Your Honor asking that you follow the negotiations. Thank you. State, you do have some victim speakers. Your Honor, um, we have the victim's uh, brother and sister present in the courtroom. They just wanted to observe, but uh, Judy Earp would like to address the court. Okay, and I do believe uh, they spoke. Yes, that's correct. If you want to stand next to the spot, really, there is the microphone right there. So we're going to have the clerk's Go ahead. Please raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony are about to give in this action should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Thank you. Please state and spell both your first and last name for our record. Judy Earp, J-U-D-Y-E-A-R-P. Thank you. Did you want to tell me about the impact that this crime has had on your life, Ms. Earp? Yes, ma'am. Dear Judge Kearney, prior to March 3rd, 2019, I would never have imagined having to make this statement my entire world was viciously ripped from me with the murder of Thomas K. Richard, my fiance and long-term partner. Since that time, I have suffered unimaginable grief and loss, which has taken its toll on me physically, emotionally, and financially. I was the first to know that something was seriously wrong when he did not get off the plane he was scheduled to fly home on. My immediate thought was to check with his office. I knew that no matter what, he would not just leave his patients without making arrangements, such as canceling and rescheduling appointments and making sure their medications were refilled, etc. I went to his office to check if he had contacted them, and when I found out he had not contacted them, I knew beyond doubt something was very wrong. I immediately went home and called the Las Vegas Metro Police and reported him missing and requested a welfare check at Kelsey Turner's residence. The man answering the door 
later identified as John Kennison, said that they had never heard of him. I relive that day in my mind every day and frequently in my dreams, and it will never go away. I will always wonder if there was something I could have done to prevent Tom from going to Las <coughs> Vegas to see Kelsey Turner. Tom was under a lot of stress, and I sincerely believe he was in the early stages of Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. So much so that two county social workers had come to the house that week prior inquiring if he was showing any signs of dementia. I told them how Kelsey Turner was manufacturing checks on Tom's LLC account and forging his signature. I highly suspect Wells Fargo was who reported the situation to senior social services. When Tom had told her repeatedly he would not give or loan her any more money, she resorted to stealing. She printed on her home computer checks with Tom's name and account number and her address. She also went online and made many, and made many charges paying her bills. The bank caught the fraud and immediately took action. When that did not work, she began extortion. She told him that she would accuse him of having child pornography. She even texted me a pornographic photo saying that it was a 10-year-old child. I showed that text and photo to two different police and a doctor, and they all told me it was not a 10-year-old child. It was just some random picture off the internet. You can imagine what kind of mental torture that was for him. Just the thought of such allegations would end his lifelong career. I believe this mental torture precipitated a rapid decline in his judgment. She lured him to Las Vegas with some story about how she was sick and couldn't take care of her child and had no money for food or medicine, etc. His last words to me were, she's such a pervasive liar that I had to see for myself. I am telling you this so that the court understands that not only was Tom physically and painfully tortured and murdered by Kelsey Turner and John Kinnison on March 3rd, 2019, but that Kelsey Turner had been mentally torturing him for quite some time before this. A day does not pass that I am not reminded of Tom and how horribly and painfully he suffered in his final hours on earth at the hands of John Kennison and Kelsey Turner. I frequently dream that Tom has come home and it was all a big mistake. Then I realize that the real nightmare is waking up and knowing that he will never come home. I never realized such evil existed in this world until this happened. Physically, it has been very difficult for me the emo emotional turmoil I have experienced was and is literally gut-wrenching. On August 10th, 2019, I became seriously ill and had to undergo emergency surgery. My intestines had become twisted, resulting in a blockage. This was due to the extreme physical and emotional stress I had undergone since Tom's murder. This is a condition that I will always have to worry about recurring. The impact of this crime has had a significant, serious impact on me financially. I knew I would have to leave our home of many years and was uncertain of where I would go, effectively resulting in possible homelessness. I was not able to afford my truck and had to sell it. I also had to sell my livestock at a loss due to the time of year and not knowing what was going to happen in the future. This crime will continue to haunt me physically and emotionally for the rest of my life. Prior to Tom's murder, Kelsey Turner had threatened <coughs> violence and even threatened to kill me if I caused her to be evicted. I was in no way responsible for her eviction. 
The fact that she hadn't paid rent was the reason for eviction. Considering the fact that she was that angry over an eviction, she will be much more angry after having been incarcerated. Obviously, this threat is to be taken very seriously, given the very reason we are here today. And I do have screenshots of those texts. I do not want to, have to spend the rest of my life constantly worrying and always looking over my shoulder if or when she is granted parole. I also want to mention many other victims of this crime, the silent ones, his patients, who are some of the most vulnerable people and most were children. I can't begin to tell you in the past how many people had come up to us and said, Dr. Burchard, you probably don't remember me, but 20 years ago you saved my life when I had tried to commit suicide. It grieves me to think how many lives have not been saved due to his murder. I also had many parents of his current patients tell me they were <coughs> devastated and didn't know how they were going to tell their children. His murder left a huge gaping hole in the whole community of Monterey. Every time I hear of a suicide in the area, I wonder if it was one of Tom's patients and is this another victim of Tom's murder? One of the hardest facts to accept is that Tom was heinously, savagely beaten, literally tortured to death, and then callously dumped in the trunk of a car and left abandoned in the desert. Even harder to accept is that this was done by a person who knew him. It was personal. But the hardest of all to accept is that from what I have seen, Kelsey Turner shows absolutely no remorse and does not accept any responsibility for the murder she committed. In light of the fact that in the 3.75 years that she has already spent incarcerated and still shows no sign of rehabilitation, I respectfully request that she be given the maximum sentence allowed by law and no parole possible. Thank you so much, Ms. Earp, for being here. I'm sorry for everything you had to go through to hold this case. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Turner, in accordance with the laws of the state of Nevada, you're hereby judged guilty of second-degree murder, a felony. I'm going to impose a $25 administrative assessment fee, the $3 DNA collection fee, $150 DNA fee, as well as the test to determine genetic markers. You're hereby sentenced to 10 to 25 years in the Nevada Department of Corrections. Additionally, there will be $2,817.34 to Nevada victims of crime that is joined in several with co-defendant Mr. Kennison. The extradition cost will be $2,280 or $2 to the attorney, a Nevada Attorney General. You have 1,375 days credit time served toward that sentence. And Your Honor, I have, um, if we could just, the restitution amount was two, Eight one seven thirty four. Okay, and that extradition cost? $2,280. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have 1,391 days credit for time served. State. Uh, Mr. Kennison, you're going to be Yes, Your Honor. Not yes, Your Honor, but she was in custody only on this matter, so I'd ask that Your Honor assess those 16 days to this case. I'll submit it. 1,391 days, I would answer. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, Mr. Court is adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor.